and welcome to the uh, trial budget hearing. This is our seventh trial budget hearing in the series on April the 8th, 2021. I'm City Manager Ed Zerker. I'm glad to be here this evening. Before we go further, I will ask our Spanish language interpreter, Mario Barajas, to uh, make an opening announcement and in instructions for interpretation. Mario? We have Mario on the line. Good afternoon. We have Mario on the line. Yes, can you hear me? We hear you, Mario. Please, please go ahead. Okay, I can't hear, but uh, I'm going to go off of uh, the feed that I do, the secondary feed I do have. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I apologize for that. Uh, my name is Mario Barajas, and together with my colleague, Elsie Duarte, we will be serving as today's uh, Spanish interpreters for the vir virtual budget audience. We ask as a favor, if you will be providing a public comment, please try to speak slowly and clear clearly so that we can try to interpret what you are saying as clearly and fully as possible. Thank you. Now, to avoid any confusion between the English and the Spanish version, I'm going to briefly explain and go over uh, the process on uh, connecting via the telephone. You'll, you're going to be dialing 602-666-0783. And as far as the meeting ID, you're going to be inputting 187-176-9398 and then pound. And once again, you're going to push uh, pound again when prompted for the attendee ID. Now I'm going to take this time to introduce myself to uh, our Spanish-speaking audience. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas y junto con mi colega El Duarte estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes para la audiencia de presupuesto virtual de hoy. Les pedimos como favor, si es que va a estar dando un comentario público, hable despacio y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para que podamos interpretar lo que esté diciendo de la manera más completa posible. Muchas gracias. Ahora les indicaré cómo acceder a la audiencia por teléfono en español si es que aún no lo ha hecho. Marcará el número de teléfono 602 666-0783. Introduzca el número de identificación o ID de la reunión que viene siendo 187-583-3063 y luego el signo de número, o sea, pound. Luego, nuevamente, va a introducir el signo de número o el pound con, cuando se le solicite el número de identificación o el ID de asistente. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mario. So this is our seventh hearing. This is the hearing designated for Council District 8. And so this time it's my privilege to introduce the council member from District 8 who's hosting the meeting, Councilmember Carlos Garcia. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Mario, and all the staff for putting this together. Um, really excited to hear from the constituents of District 8. Um, we've been here for a year and a half, uh, in office for a year and a half. Uh, but the last year has been during the pandemic. The pandemic has taught us a lot and hopefully pushed us to rethink and revalue uh, a lot of the things that we do as a city. And um, I said it before, I think this document, the budget document is a moral document and something that shows the values of our city. So excited to hear from the constituents of District 8 and other folks. Um, uh, just a reminder to please uh, look for the Fun Phoenix um, tool, web tool online. It not only allows you to let us know how you think or how we can move the money around, but it also gives you an opportunity to understand and see, and you can spend some time playing around on where the monies go in the city. Um, that's all I have to say, and, and thank you, Ed. Thank you, Council Member. So the uh, program this evening, uh, we will have a vi short video and then we will take comments.
Before we do that, I do want to recognize that we have uh, several city staff members uh, online and even here, uh, socially distanced, wearing masks, uh, to listen and uh, take notes on what's going on. Uh, we also want to thank our budget and research department who puts these together. Amber Williamson is the director. She's here at the table, and many of her staff are here helping us run the meeting. The uh, trial budget for this year has uh, a good amount of resources available to do important things. And so part, one part of that, and you'll hear this in the, in the video, one part of that is compensation for employees to retain and attract good employees, but also to recognize that Phoenix employees have largely tread water in their wages over the last 12 years uh, from the Great Recession forward. There's uh, also funding in this budget to do things that we've heard from the community and the council are important in six areas. Administrative accountability, continuing some COVID uh, relief efforts, responding to growth, and one of the big things uh, relative to District 8 is the large community center, the Cesar Chavez Community Center, which is, I believe, actually in District 7, but is surrounded on three sides by District 8. Uh, at baseline and about 20, uh, 30, 35th Avenue. And it is the first large community center, recreation center to open in the city of Phoenix since 2006 when the Pecos Community Center opened. And so that's a, a really important um, thing that we're able to do this year uh, with, with the budget. And it's been a labor of love, I know, for many of the residents of District 7 and 8 in the Levine area. So responding to growth is important. Also uh, addressing climate change and response to heat, uh, affordable housing and, uh, and homelessness, and the largest area in this year's budget uh, for programs has to do with public safety, and particularly not in the sworn area, but in ways to respond to mental health and behavioral health crisis uh, through some teams. And that actually grows out of a, uh, a traumatic incident reviewed ad hoc committee from a couple of years ago, and we're now able to have resources to do some important work that responds to, to some items there. The, all this information is available on our website, phoenix.gov slash budget. In uh, a year where we're not meeting virtually, these hard copy books are available, but these are available on the website as well as a, a whole lot of other resources at the phoenix.gov slash budget website. We invite you to take 15 minutes or 15 hours if you'd like to review that information. And as Councilmember Garcia noted and has been uh, really good at promoting, the Fund Phoenix tool is also available there. So the uh, eight minute video we'll show here is just an overview. There's much more depth available on the website. After that, we will go to um, public comments and uh, Matt will read the names. But at this point, I think we're ready to go to our, vid to our video. Thank you. The City of Phoenix trial budget for fiscal year 2021-22 proposed by the Phoenix City Manager is ready for public review and comment. The goal of this trial budget is to identify programs and services that build a better, more inclusive city for all. Phoenix has a long history of public budgeting, giving the community a voice in the future of our city by starting the public involvement much earlier than required. This year, due to the pandemic, public involvement will be virtual. But our goal is that we will provide even more opportunities for you to share your feedback. We'll host virtual budget community hearings between April 2nd and April 20th in both English and Spanish by council district and citywide for youth and for seniors. And this year, we've launched the Fund Phoenix Tool, an interactive way to share what's important to you when it comes to city programs and services. The law requires the city's budget to be balanced each year. And this year, we are happy to report a projected budget surplus of $153 million, made up of $98 million in one-time funds and $55 million in ongoing funding. 
This is thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council and the city's strategic use of data to direct our efforts during the pandemic. City employees have stood on the front lines of the pandemic, more than a year and counting, to provide critical services and support to our residents and customers. Approximately 77% of the surplus in the 2021-22 trial budget is allocated to employee compensation, to continue to retain and recruit top talent, to provide the level of service our customers rely on to stay safe, healthy, and connected. $35 million is allocated to address important needs raised by the council and the community across six areas. Focus Area 1, Public Safety Reform and Responsiveness. More accountability, responsiveness, transparency, and trust is demanded from public safety programs. In this budget proposal, the city expands an already successful fire department program where trained mental health experts respond to 911 callers needing crisis health services. The expansion of the Community Assistance Program follows community and council requests for innovative ways to respond to crisis calls for service with mental health professionals rather than police officers. This not only strengthens health outcomes, but frees up police officers and firefighters to focus on public safety calls, reducing response times for our community. In addition, the budget adds other important public safety reforms by adding additional 911 operators, reducing wait time for police public records, improving police officer accountability through an improved human resource management system, and more comprehensive reports reporting of crime data. Focus Area 2, COVID Response and Resiliency. The city's navigated the COVID pandemic well, protecting employees and the community because we have relied on data and contracted public health experts to inform our efforts. We transitioned City Hall to an appointment-only model. We also pivoted our programs and services to support the community in need of Wi-Fi connectivity and access to emergency food support and virtual and curbside library services requiring additional staffing and technology enhancements. Fundings required to continue these efforts through the pandemic. Focus Area 3, Climate Change and Heat Readiness. Climate change and the record-breaking heat in Phoenix call for investment in strategies to address the negative impacts on our residents, particularly our most vulnerable, including seniors and those in poverty and experiencing homelessness. The trial budget includes a new Office of Heat Response and Mitigation to focus these efforts, the addition of staff to plant and maintain trees, and advance the city's Cool Corridors program, all to meet the goals of the Tree and Shade Master Plan to double the tree canopy by 2030 and reduce the impact of heat. Focus Area 4, Affordable Housing and Homelessness. The city has a lack of affordable housing and more people experiencing homelessness than ever before. The City Council approved a Housing Phoenix Plan and a Homeless Strategies Plan to find solutions to identify funding to increase and improve affordable housing units and to leverage federal funding and work with community partners to help those experiencing homelessness. Funding will provide staffing and programs to foster affordable housing developments on city-owned land and ensure the safety and security of those experiencing homelessness and the impacted neighborhoods and businesses. Focus Area 5, Building Community and Responding to Growth. There continues to be a great need to connect underserved communities to the economic benefits of our city's continued growth. We will fund programs and services that foster equitable education and recreation opportunities for youth and special needs populations, including the Phoenix Public Library's College Depot, Clean and Safe Neighborhoods, and support for homegrown small businesses. 
Funding will support the growing needs at city parks and recreation centers, including the new Cesar Chavez Community Center, scheduled to open in the fall of 2021, Margaret T. Hans Park in downtown Phoenix, and Deem Hills Recreation Area in North Phoenix, as well as the successful inclusive recreation program for residents with special needs. We also propose an increase in funding for arts and historic preservation grants. Focus Area 6, Administrative Accountability. The city must continue to foster a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment to live and work for residents and employees. To succeed, we propose to create the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We'll also invest in technologies to support data-driven decision-making across city departments and to protect the city's IT systems from cybersecurity threats enhance election processes to increase engagement in city elections and connect residents to library and park services. This has been just a taste of what you will find in the 2021-2022 City of Phoenix trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget available online at phoenix.gov budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at one of our 14 community budget hearings or by email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. Through our Fund Phoenix interactive tool, you can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use the hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. The city manager will present his proposed budget for 2021-22 to the Phoenix City Council on May 4th, 2021. The council's budget decision will take place on May 18th, 2021. Both meetings will be streamed online and on Phoenix TV. Thank you for being part of this important process. We look forward to hearing your ideas for this year's trial budget and the future of Phoenix. This is the uh, trial budget hearing for Council District 8, hosted by Councilmember Carlos Garcia. And with that, we will go to our list of speakers. Matt will uh, read the names. Matt. Thank you, sir. First, I'd like to read a short statement on conduct during the hearing for public comment. Members of the public will have the opportunity for speak, to speak for up to two minutes on budget issues of interest or concern to them. Speakers must present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language and personal attacks on members of the public, council members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules can lose their opportunity to continue to speak. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the city council to listen to the comments, but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. And with that, our first speaker is Linda Abeg. Linda, are you on the line? Yes. Please proceed. I'm here to request that the $156,000 for the maintenance for the park at 55th Avenue and Samantha be added to the budget. We have several long undeveloped parks in wing, so we need to get started. I'd like to share with you uh, some reasons why the lot at 55th Avenue and Samantha would be a good place to start on the parks in Levine. If you came down for a visit to 55th Avenue and Samantha, I would take you on a short half mile walk. Standing there at the not, not park, as my kids and I call it, I would show you that it is surrounded by a small neighborhood with no across the street. It houses over 1,000 pre-K through eighth grade students. Its dual language program makes it the highest enrolling school in the district. It's also Title I. At the beginning of our short walk, we'd cross 55th Avenue at a four-way stop. As soon as we cross, I'd be able to show you Fairfax High School, one of two Phoenix Union High Schools in Levine with close to 2,000 students. I would tell you how this whole street was lined with graduates celebrating in their cars for the drive through commencement during COVID. I could tell you how spectators for Fairfax's track event once had nowhere to go except HOA retention and got kicked out. Standing next to Fairfax, you'd look left at the newly constructed rooftops of Levine's first rental community. Looking straight forward, you'd have a view of the Loop 202. The only thing between you and the freeway would be dirt dirt that will soon be home to Harkins and apartment complexes. I would explain that with all of these students, neighborhoods, multifamily developments, and commercial retail, 
Having no park for three miles is unacceptable, especially when there's an empty park lot within half a mile of all of these places and over $9 million of impact fees collected to be used for neighborhood parks like this. Fees that will be eligible for refund to landowners beginning in three years. The park on Samantha will benefit thousands of our Levine residents. In this fast growing area, right by the Loop 202 corridor, we need funds from the community services and growth area of the 2021-22 budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Cooper. Lisa, are you on the line? Uh, it, it looks like Lisa is not on the line at the moment. So next we'll go to Frank Deaver. Frank, are you on the line? Frank? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Hi, another resident of Levine calling to support the 156,000 for the park at 55th Avenue and Samantha. I've uh, been a resident here 14 years waiting for the park to be built. It's great. We're getting a big project like the Cesar Chavez Community Center, but also asking for the smaller projects to be funded like this local neighborhood park. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lena Gallego Otero. Lena, are you on the line? Okay, it looks like Lena is not on the line. So our next speaker then would be Patty Araguin Garcia. Patty, are you on the line? Me. Hello. Patty, I'm yes. here. Please, please proceed. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm also uh, a member of the Levine community, and I live a block away north of Samantha Way. So my house is in direct view of the empty lot and has been for the last 11 years. And um, when I purchased the home here, there was a lot of empty lots in front of the park and they were selling, those lots were selling at a $10,000 premium, be, you know, to have a house built in front of what continues to be an empty lot. So um, I feel for the residents who had to pay that premium and have had nothing to show for it. Um, so also, I mean, I have a 19-year-old that has gone off to NAU now, grew up without a park. I have a three-year-old now that I would be, I would love to have that available, considering there is a budget surplus, considering the school, um, to say a point across the street from the empty lot that would be a park, um, is also committing to helping with the maintenance of the park. Um, I just don't see why it's not doable. The 202 is up. We have... Um, I understand one of your focus areas is to have more green space, to have more trees, to keep um, you know our our environment cooler. Um, so that would be a big you know plus in your in that direction. And also, um, you know, I, I understand also the need for affordable housing. Plenty of land space all over Arizona, all over the city of Phoenix. Uh, it's really want, and that's. It's, an, it's necessary. I understand the need for um, housing, for affordable housing, but we also need this park here in the community. Our next speaker is Hannah Heyman. Hannah, are you on the line? The city is completely ignoring what the community wants our money spent on. They spend almost $1 billion every year on the most violent cops in the nation without asking us for what we really want. We want our money spent on housing and community care. We want our money spent on food, water, and the environment. We want our money spent on education and child care. We want our money spent on better parks. We want our money spent on reparations and universal basic income. We don't want to hear any more claims of our demands being unrealistic. What's unrealistic is elected officials keeping their jobs while they tell us no, instead of telling us yes. After a year of black and directly impacted communities demanding no more money to the violent Phoenix Police Department, the city is promising millions more in funding to increase the staff and power of the most violent police force in the nation. Our elected officials will have abandoned us if they let this continue. After a year of COVID-19, the unsheltered population has increased exponentially. The city programs for rent and housing assistance are understaffed and underfunded. The city is only suggesting 2.7 million out of this $153 million surplus to go toward affordable housing and homelessness. That's a disgrace. The city could spend millions more to actually help people get and keep housing, but instead they spend our money on sweeps to harass and harm the unsheltered community. 
And I would like to speak to Ed on the process he has instituted to collect community feedback. Uh, the budget tool that's on the website. It's a good idea in theory, but it's horribly inaccessible for disabled folks trying to use it. You have to click on the budget hundreds of times to reduce funding for some of these departments. It is doesn't explain what's going on. And you changed the tool on April 1st. So will you please explain to us how this tool that you've implemented to collect feedback from the community and like, how are you being accountable to the community for the data that you're keeping from us? Um, because if you've changed the tool halfway through, how are you going through and reconciling that? Uh, we need you to be transparent about what you're doing here. I'll ask Amber if she could um, explain the Fund Phoenix tool. Yes, hi. So we ended up updating the Fund Phoenix tool to just include the proposed trial budget additions. It doesn't include an adopted budget as the tool did previous to that. We wanted to provide the community an opportunity to evaluate each proposed addition and either increase it or decrease it. And then there's an area where residents can go and suggest items that they would like added to the budget. So once we move through the trial budget process and the budget is adopted for 21-22, the, tw the tool, excuse me, will be updated again to reflect the full adopted budget. Information in the tool is, as you know, I'm, I believe that residents are aware, is collected and it's shared with the council, but also on our website is multiple documents, including information on the proposed additions, as well as last year's adopted budget. Our next speaker is Savina Bouvacet. Savina, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. So first of all, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to share our comments. Um, I am speaking on behalf of the park on 55th and Samantha Way, and really to talk about the need for that park, not just because of the growth in our area, but with the pandemic, it's really forced a lot of our children to have this new life of being on electronics and a virtual environment and they really need a place to play and get out um, for the, the health and wellness of the community and for our children. So I'm asking you to consider having the park added to your maintenance budget for this year. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ana Hernandez. Ana, are you on the line? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Hi, my name is Anna. Thank you for um, allowing us a chance to speak. Um, I would like to suggest on this budget that we reallocate about 5.5% police budget and redistribute it to the community areas, as previous speakers have said, parks and greenery and affordable housing and, you know, to help our unsheltered folks. Um, also, I would like to see that from that 5 five and a half if we could reduce the police budget by that, that those funds also be uh, put aside to fund the uh, OAT. Um, I don't believe that it's right that the funding for OAT comes from other departments. It should come from the police budget as it is needed in order to hold them accountable. Also, in regards to the uh, new program that you're that you've brought up about uh, police not responding to mental health calls, um, I believe that $15 million should also come from the police budget um, in order to support the program and support the community. Um, if we hit, if we reduce fund funding from other areas, all we're doing is we're maintaining and putting us in a more dire situation than we already are. Um, there's no reason why millions Tens of millions of dollars should be kept being poured into the uh, Phoenix Police Department when there is so much need for our community in other areas. Um, specific, I mean, you heard all the previous speakers, you know, just in one area, they have parks, and that's what we need all over the city. Um, and there's just so many areas of concern in the city that could use funding to make us successful and make us healthy. Um, so that would be my suggestions with this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I just want to also make clear and, and to amplify your comments 
there is in this budget, uh, the base budget, $3 million allocated for an Office of Accountability and Transparency. It uh, is sitting and it's awaiting uh, any council action to implement that office. So that, that funding is available in the budget. Our next speaker is Christy Bursa. Christy, are you on the line? Yes, hello. Please proceed. Um, thank you for the opp Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and letting our voices be heard. My name is Christy Bursa. I am a wife and mother of two children. We live in the Paseo Point community, not far from where the proposed park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way would be built. I am here to advocate for the park maintenance to be added to the budget. There is no park within three miles of this area and this community is growing very quickly. We have two large schools in this area and many families. With the surplus in the budget, this seems like the perfect opportunity to get our long awaited park built. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Diane Post. Diane, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Please proceed. I am a 40-year 40, 40 resident of Phoenix, and I am here to say no increase to the Phoenix police at all. This agreement that the made between plea and the city is disingenuous at best. Should the police representatives in the state legislature achieve their results, plea will have given up nothing, and the people will be right back where we started. The first provision about removing the language warning a citizen that they could be charged with a crime for filing a false complaint that's an HB 2550, which would mandate that notice statewide. That bill has already passed the House and the Senate Judiciary and rules. The second provision that says non-police can be, can be on a civilian oversight committee, which is ridiculous. The bill 2567, HB 2567, mandates what training and experience a person must have to sit on a law enforcement oversight board. These restrictions are so narrow that the only people who can meet them are police officers. So if that bill passes, we have got nothing out of this settlement. The bill has passed the House and it has passed Senate Judiciary and rules. The third provision covers two of these, quote, settlements, and that is that a witness may meet with the union first and that there are 10 categories of past discipline that could be used in later discipline. Well, this bill is HB 2295, that the officer always gets a 10-day notice and that nothing put in the disciplinary database can later be used, making it absolutely useless. This bill has also passed the House, the Senate Jude, and rules. So for plea to sign this agreement, they must make an agreement that they will stop these bills because they are being carried solely for plea, otherwise we are suckered. The police should be given no raise at all until they learn responsibility and take accountability for their actions, which they refuse to do for 40 years. Any lawsuits against the police must come out of their budget, not the public pockets, and officers must carry malpractice insurance like doctors and lawyers do and be responsible Please for their own behavior. Time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tiffany Hawkins. Tiffany, are you on the line? Yes, Tiffany Hawkins is on the line. Please proceed. I can barely hear you, though. We can hear you very well. You can proceed. Oh, I, um, I'm i calling. I live in District 8. I live off of 19th Avenue in Southern. Um, we were top uh, Lindell Park area, and we had met with the tree transportation, and we also met with our... Um, Carlos Garcia, we were talking about, um, we're coming, bringing to you guys about bringing more funding into our community to redo our island that runs from 19th Avenue and Hildigo all the way to 23rd Avenue and Hildigo. But we we're asking for more funding because we needed new water pipes to be put in because everything is dead in our island and our trees are not being uh, watered properly. I think they do doing them once every I think it's every three months or something they put water down or something to that effect. And so that's why we're, that's why I'm on the line tonight to talk about that. Thank, thank you, Tiffany. Um, our city engineer is here on behalf of the street transportation part department. And so he did hear your comments and concerns and we'll make sure that streets is following up with you and your neighbors on that request. 
I think you probably have also talked with District 8 as well. So. Yes, thank you, Tiffany, for being on. Um, myself and staff were out there last week. I, I thank you for, for bringing the community together, and that was a good meeting, and we'll, we'll make sure to try to take care of that. But thank you for joining us tonight. Our next speaker is Veronica Baca. Veronica, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Yes, my name is Veronica Baca. I'm a, uh, I live in the Levine District, uh, District 8. My, I have three children that go to Paseo Point. I am um, for the budget of 156 to go to the park at Samantha Way and 100, uh, 55th Avenue. Um, it's pretty sad that there is no park within a three mile radius and I really would uh, hope that you would consider getting this park built for our children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amanda Jones. Amanda, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. All right. Good evening. I'm here in support of the park on Samantha Way and 55th Avenue. I'd like to show why building this park is in alignment with all six policy areas mentioned in the budget. First, public safety reform and responsiveness. Both the International Journal of Environmental Research and the Manhattan Institute found that the presence of parks reduces urban crime. So let's build the park. Climate change and heat resilience. For the City Park Alliance website, Green spaces reduce water pollution, decrease illness, clean tons of pollutants from the air, and cool our cities by as much as eight degrees. Parks hedge against environmental racism so long as city planners place, build, and maintain them equitably throughout the city. Let's build the park. Affordable housing and homelessness. Green parks are a socioeconomic equalizer. The NCBI found that community recreation facilities is one of the strongest indicators of socioeconomic health in low income areas. So let's build the park. Community services and growth. Levine has no shortage of growth. We have grown and continue to grow, but our parks have sat as vacant lots for more than a decade. So let's build the park. Administrative accountability. Levine currently has 10 parks that were promised to the community. Our neighborhoods were literally designed around this promise. Phoenix benefits from our taxes. It is time for accountability to provide what was promised for those taxes. So let's build the park. COVID response and recovery. COVID is a virus that preys on the physically vulnerable. It is not a coincidence that populations statistically most affected are also those with the least access to health and recreational amenities. So let's build the park and let's start with Samantha Way. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ainsley Anjanu. Ainsley, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Please proceed. My name is Ainsley Anjanu, and I am also um, a member of the Levine community and also a teacher here in Levine. And I am asking for the funding to build and maintain the park on 55th Avenue. Samantha Way. Um, again, like everyone else was saying, we just need to make this a priority um, for our children right now, a, a safe place for them to be able to play outside um, where they're not centered around technology and um, encourage this outdoor play and community building in our neighborhood. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Waddell. Chris, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Waddell. I am District 8. Um, I am the Vice Chair for the Phoenix uh, Arts and Commission, um, Arts and Culture Commission. And I just want to say that I really would appreciate um, the continued support in the arts. Um, first of all, because I'm an artist. Um, and second of all, um, although I did not grow up in Phoenix, I um, became an artist because I was exposed as a youth um, to arts through grants that were available through the city that I lived in. Um, and so it, it really um, gives exposure. I'd like to thank uh, the city council for supporting the arts organization and individual art uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, I just feel like we were very um, great at uh, being really supporting our art community. Um, 
council prioritize funding for the arts through their standard budgeting process and through emergency relief funding. Thank you so much. Um, we are so thrilled to see the city um, is just um, demonstrating continued dedication um, to the arts se sector and increasing the arts budget means more access for arts programming all around the city. And it also ensures that the community public art is maintained to continue to be points of inspiration and beauty in our residents. Um, just want to thank you so much for including an increase of $200,000 toward the Office of Arts and Culture Programming and Public Art Maintenance. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Audrea Nunley. Audrey, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you so much. Please proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, my name is Audrea Nunley, and I am a Lindo Park community uh, member for over 50 years. And first, I want to thank uh, Carlos Garcia and his team, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Eric Wilson, who met with the community on um, uh, last Friday, April 2nd. So that was a really good meeting. But I just wanted to, uh, we have a, our islands are uh, undeveloped here. And um, uh, we spoke to Mr. Um, Wilson and he does have a budget money, but not enough. And the estimated cost will be approximately $50,000. So I wanted to just, you know, uh, include, see if we can include that in the budget process. Thank you. Thank you, Audrea. Yes, we, we uh, will include that in our consideration. Our next speaker is Sean Severud. Sean, are you on the line? Yes. Uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, Councilman Garcia for hosting, and I think more importantly, uh, the staff of District 8 for being the best staff of, of all the districts. <laughs> and um, also just want to say, um, and really focus my comments in today on sort of, you know, what I am seeing issues with in the city, which is obviously the lack of affordable housing um, and um, our unsheltered folks and homeless folks. It, you know, it's really become something increasingly that's become an area of huge concern, especially obviously you've got people moving in from other areas of the country. Um, you've got people, um, investment firms, uh, pension funds, buying up large swaths of single-family residents throughout the country. Um, it's really impossible for people, uh, everyday people, middle-class people, low-income folks, to buy um, homes. Uh, I rent uh, in District 8, and pretty soon I'm going to be priced out of here, and I've got a fairly decent income. So imagine how the low income folks in this district and in the city at large are going to deal with this. So, you know, when we look at um, affordable housing and when we look at addressing um, solutions for our unsheltered folks, we really have to look big. Um, you know, as far as the budget goes, you know, whatever you're looking at, double it, triple it, quadruple it, it still won't be enough. And then we really have to find ways to limit the sort of investments that are going on, um, these, these pension funds and investment firms coming in here doing cash offers and swooping in and buying up all the real estate. And more importantly, when we take funds out of the police budget, we need to actually pull them out and reallocate them to things that actually matter, like affordable housing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ramon Gomez. Ramon, are you on the line? Yes, good evening. Yes, sir. Please proceed. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Ramon Gomez. I'm a Levine resident of the Paseo Point uh, subdivision. I'm a District 8 uh, member. Well, I want to start off by thanking uh, Council Member Carlos Garcia for everything you do for us. I've uh, lived here uh, six years in uh, Paseo Point. Uh, this subdivision was the last one to be built when I first bought here. Uh, across the lot, when they were building the house, you could see nothing but the empty lots, including the uh, school lot, which is, has now been built in the park. Uh, we were told that the park, the school, and the 202 were going to be built in the future. It's been six years and longer from what I've heard with other constituents. Uh, and this park is way overdue. 
it is the eyesore of this beautiful community. Lavina is growing so much. It's becoming so rich in just the community in and of itself. Uh, so be, that being the eyesore, that's something that I, I would like to be fixed. Uh, Lavina is growing uh, exponentially uh, with the TOT promoting even more growth. Especially south of Dobbins, it's, uh, you can see now how many homes are being built and stacked now. The closest park is three miles away from where I live. Uh, it's not suitable for children or people in the community to go if they want to walk or ride somewhere to a park. Uh, Paseo Point, uh, two weeks ago, had a Play 6 event. Uh, the field and the playground were packed with uh, parents and kids. Uh, if that park would have been built, uh, they could have used that property and expand the event into that and where they weren't so jam-packed. Uh, building this park will promote quality of life and well-being uh, for kids, adults, and everyone in this uh, community. This is uh, necessary, especially after COVID. We've seen how that's been affecting us. The price will be 156000 which Please is very finish minimal. Please your comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Isabel Acosta. Isabel, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I also live on Paseo Point, and I am all for the park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way. Living here for the past five, six years, we live in a beautiful community. We have lovely neighbor. Um, neighborhood and our neighbors are amazing. Um, we do have a lot of kids riding bikes and always going back and forth on our street because we do live on a cul-de-sac. But one thing is missing for sure is a big family park that will suit all different ages. My family does come from Texas and they travel with a lot of the little ones. And unfortunately, not just my household, but our neighbor's household has to leave out of our community just to take our kiddos to a bigger park for any activities, events, or social gatherings. Um, like said before, the, the biggest park to us would be on 35th and Baseline, which is not convenient for us when we can just walk to this area that's not even being used. With that being said, I am for this big park for community closeness. It would bring um, a lot more beauty to our neighborhood, and we would be a lot closer as well as neighbors. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Buckman. Karen, are you on the line? I am here. Please proceed. Good evening. As we're moving forward this year with new programs, new centers and buildings, more trees for heat mitigation, and renovating current parks in various locations of Phoenix, please don't forget to first do a look back to the past 14 years when projects were skipped over and not completed due to the lack of funding. The city park that was designated 14 years ago at 55th Avenue and Samantha Way is one of those amenities that is past due for completion. 55th Avenue and Samantha Way is lo located between Baseline Road and Dobbins Road and a few blocks east of, of the new 202 freeway. Specifically, the parcel numbers are 300-13-810 and 300-13-792. I own a home with my husband directly across the street from this designated unbuilt park on Samantha Way and would welcome the completion of this last dirt lot in the middle of our neighborhood. There are many of our neighbors and those in close by neighborhoods getting involved in online discussions about what would go in there. Of course, the city parks and rec designers would be guided depending on the amount of the, of the budget allocated by the council for construction and maintenance. Getting the council to include this project in the budget for construction is the first step. Again, the city should not forget to allocate funds for things skipped over in past years. At least the park at 55th Avenue and Samantha Way is a great start. Thank you for listening. Our next speaker is Marcus Reed. Marcus, are you on the line? Uh, it appears that Marcus is not on the line. So our next speaker is Amber Villavalzo. Amber, are you on the line? 
It looks as though Amber is also not on the line, so then our next speaker would be Tanya Glass. Tanya, are you on the line? I am, I am. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about the parks. Um, I, I believe that there are 10 parks within Levine that need to be built out. I think an equitable way to decide or make a decision on where to start is to have a ranking system based on safety, age of the vacancy, blight, and uh, lighting and security. Additionally, I think that <clears throat> the city of Phoenix can use ASU and their capstone master's program partnership to get innovative ideas about drought resistant parks since uh, water seems to be a big issue. Um, I participated while working at the city of Phoenix in that program and a lot of good ideas uh, were brought out by the students and a few were implemented. <clears throat> I also would like to talk about the mental health response. Recently, uh, the week of Christmas, myself and the, uh, my neighbors uh, had 48 hours of hell. We had a neighbor, a longtime neighbor, that had a mental health crisis called the crisis hotline. They said, call the police and gave a, uh, the crisis hotline, gave myself and neighbors and the uh, spouse of the person having a mental health breakdown advice how to call 911 and get appropriate help. When we called 911 to get the appropriate help, we were told because this individual was not a threat to themselves, was not committing the acts at that time at, e at my property or at the other neighbor's property that they could not send out a response. 48 hours my neighborhood, my block, work together to try to find help for my neighbor. Uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to identify people outside of the city of Phoenix to provide some, some help. Uh, my neighbor actually took their spouse to a mental health facility to try to get help, and they were, there was no yeah. help. Yeah. yeah, can she finish up? Uh, please proceed. Um, and there was no help uh, with any city agency. Um, I am well aware with uh, different policies within the city and, and different responses and still no help. If you would like the receipts, you can go to the 911 calls that were made uh, the week of Christmas, I believe beginning December 22nd. The spouse couldn't get help. The neighbors couldn't get help. The, the neighbor in question that was having the mental break was going up and down the street for 24 hours, every hour ringing on everyone's bell, uh, asking, asking for frivolous things. She was uh, schizophrenic and was having a break. She also had COVID, which was putting the neighbors in danger as well. So when it comes to the, the, the process that you're, you're stating that the fire department is to come out, no one came out. Thank you, Tanya. I'm, I'm sorry you experienced that. And that's a story that illustrates the, the, one of the reasons why we think this is an important program and proposed it. It would be designed to address exactly what you're describing with people who are trained health and behavioral specialists rather than having to rely on police. So thank, thank you for sharing that. Okay, because of that experience and another experience, I would be more than happy to volunteer and assist in any way in that program going forward. I think it's, it's best to have real life experiences, uh, success and uh, unsuccessful stories to improve the program. So uh, Councilman Garcia knows how to get a, uh, in contact with me. So if you need some assistance, I'm here to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think <clears throat> just just also so you know, we had a conversation about this during the, the youth budget hearing. Um, we're still gonna work on, on making sure that this department works well with the community. Um, we're hoping, and because we're gonna be intentional, that it won't actually be fully, um, you know, it won't be fully developed for another probably 24 months. But those kinds of stories are exactly, and, and your contribution is exactly what we need to make sure that those scenarios um, are the ones we are addressing. And I also just want to recognize you and thank you and your community for, for coming together and supporting each other during that tough time. And, and hopefully soon we'll be able to have resources to support folks like yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Colby. 
Uh, okay. Col Colby is on the line. Okay, this is Colby. Hello, I am seven years old, and you should build the park. I think you should build the park. You know, it's like across from Paseo Point. It's been ten years which is like older than I am since you promised. And then, and um, so yeah, but it's gonna be a big one. Um, I have seen someone with, uh, that are huge with like one trash can and it was a lot of trash and litter <laughs> and like, Maybe have more, a couple more trash cans than usual, cause like bro, those parks have a lot of litter. <laughs> Were you able to hear Colby? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, thank we heard you. Colby and, and thank you, Colby, for spending two evenings with us this week, and and we heard you loud and clear. Good job, buddy. And our next speaker is Janelle Wood. Janelle, are you on the line? Uh, it looks as though Janelle is not on the line. Our next speaker then is Asher Abig. Asher, are you on the line? Okay, uh, it appears as though Asher is also not on the line. So uh, we would uh, go next to Amy Meglio. Amy, are you on yes, the line? Yes, hello. Please Can you proceed. Hear me? Yes, ma'am, please proceed. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So first, I'd like to thank Carlos Garcia and District 8 for being one of the two dissenting votes on the MOU. Um, I really want to acknowledge it takes bravery and strength and a will to stand up for what's right to vote in what for uh, what you already know will be a dissent and that the bravery of your district in doing that does not go unnoticed. Um, I tune in for the after meeting lives with D8 and I'm hopeful that you are right, Council Member Garcia, um, that we are making progress and that in two years we can flip the vote. Um, so holding on to that hope. Um, on a personal note, while my work base is out of District 4, I deliver food all over Phoenix. And when I have wait times on pickups, I use the Find My District tool, and it always makes me smile when District 8 comes up. Um, thanks for being a district I'm proud to help fuel the economy in. Um, by now, you probably figured out it's Amy Meglio, volunteer lead coordinator with the Grassroots Law Project, um, and also a member of the Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program. Um, and together, our organizations will be presenting a petition with 18 demands for the Phoenix cap to council and the mayor. Um, but tonight, I really want to focus on a deeper dive into what it means when the city says the language for the ordinance will come later. So, like, is the city willing to commit today to an ordinance that will explicitly state first responders will not and the cap will not report names, personal information, or any details about their interactions with PPD or ICE. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, Amy. So that question came up from Jacob earlier uh, this week and, and also today. So the CAP program, as Councilmember Garcia said, is not fully formed and that's actually intentional because it's something that needs to be developed over a period of time with lots of input. The, um, the idea of the CAP program is that it is non-sworn police, non-sworn, non-police response, that it is trained behavioral health, mental health professionals who are responding to people who are in crisis. The um, only connection with the police department would be if something rises to the level of an imminent danger or a crime. But other than that, it would be the trained professionals who would be responding. The, uh, the, the only time that there's a connection with ICE is mandated by state law is that when there is an arrest, a booking, or a citation in lieu of detention. So assuming that those things aren't happening because we're sending non-police officers who, who can't arrest or detain, there would, be, there would be no connection with ICE in that regard. Our next speaker is Andy Abkarian. Andy, are you on the line? I am. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilman Garcia, for, for hosting this. My name is Andy Abkarian. I am a, dis an, um, 
a resident of District 7, but I do live downtown, so very close to, to uh, District 8. Thank you all for all the work on the budget tools and for this participatory process. Mr. Mario, I will try to speak slowly enough that you can translate, but I do need to fit into my two minutes. So um, I am really heartened to see the balanced approach to the non-compensate non-compensation related expenditures on the surplus, and especially that the city is maintaining a connection to long-term livability while also meeting the circumstances and uh, current needs of the citizens. So in addition to the funding of the COVID response and resilience and the affordable housing and homelessness, the access to technology and pandemic related challenges, it's really important. And I see that the trial budget has addressed the Phoenix sustainability and reducing the heat island effect. Um, that includes the Office of Heat Response and Mitigation, meeting the goals of the Tree and Shade Master Plan, and including a tree and shade administrator. The funding for the Streets, Transportation, Roadway Safety Action Plan, and funding for increase in the shade coverage at the parks and or addition of new parks. So in the building community and responding to growth, I think it would be important to have more of CED's budget allocated to business and workforce development line item, specifically serving as a liaison to the current and future businesses that are uh, trying to re-engage or respond to some of the changes uh, related to COVID. And lastly, one area that I did want to mention that is perennially underfunded is the preserving our, our historic assets. The budget has an addition of some king grants, but to see some one applications to saving Please some public work resources. Comment. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And just on workforce development, we have a significant funding from our in our human services department from federal workforce investment opportunity act funds. And there's a connection with our community and economic development department. There's uh, also an opportunity perhaps for some connection through the um, American Rescue Plan Act funds that the city receives. Uh, the council will be discussing that later to, uh, to connect workforce even, even more into the small business area. Our next speaker is Jacob Rayford. Jacob, are you on the line? Yes, I am, I am here. Um, first, I wanna go back and just Tiny, if you're still listening, thank you for your story. It was very brave. Um, I have to take my time to acknowledge that. Um, but yeah, my name is Jacob Rayford, everyone. Uh, again, a concerned community member and an advocate for the Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program, or NOCAP, which is an initiative, of course, to create a department that'll, you know, the same name that handles wellness, uh, nonviolent crime dispatches, behavioral health, crisis assistance, calls pertaining to our sisters and brothers of the unsheltered community. You already know. So first, I did quickly want to acknowledge Councilmember Garcia for doing the right thing last night by voting no against that highly unethical and dishonest MOU bill. Um, but I kind of wanted to go back to my question, and I believe Amy touched on it a little bit earlier. My question to uh, City Manager Ed Zerker um, earlier this morning during District 3's meeting, we asked, of course, if you intended on your iteration of a CAHOOTS inspired crisis assistance program to defer to the police department, ICE, or any carceral entity, law enforcement agency, you did state that's not your intention and did kind of say so now that uh, CAP department would not report to the police unless there is uh, criminal activity. I believe you also mentioned violence. Um, but still, I do feel that there's still a little ambiguous. I wanted to center the discussion around your definition of criminal activity as, for instance, the very act of illegal substance abuse would, would be considered criminal. So really for this program to be genuine, there needs to be a complete and definitive guarantee through legislative language, ordinance, however you word it, that this entity will become its own fully independent and funded department and will not involve police activity for nonviolent crimes. Um, are these things that we can see in writing that you can commit to? Um, again, um, it needs to be in writing that they will exhaust all, um, you know, the units would exhaust all nonviolent de-escalation tactics before deferring to another department. Is this something that you can commit to? Because a crime is simply written law that's broken. There needs to be language in CAP's design that defines nonviolent crimes as being dispatched by your program. Um, so we also want to, before you cut me off, I want to make sure that there is an ad hoc committee that's designed for this department. Please finish your comment. Thank you. Just want to make sure there's an ad hoc committee for this department that we need to see need to make sure there's some sort of commitment from our city that this can happen 
Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for the input. So just, there's nothing has been developed uh, in writing at this point to be able to give you definitive answers on those things, but I think the important here is the input and the feedback you're giving are things that we will have to address as we develop it. So yes, you have the commitment that we're going to address all those questions. The outcome of that, I can't tell you specifically right now. And thank you, Jacob, for calling and, and Amy as well. We share um, those concerns. I do think we're gonna have to look into confidentiality. Um, you know, we've had conversations with other folks in other cities, mainly the CAHOOTS program in, in Oregon and, and Denver and other folks, and they may already have some of this language. Um, I thought I heard earlier that you all also have some of this language, so looking forward to reviewing that with you all and making sure that yes, in a scenario like was brought up earlier um, by Ms. Glass, uh, we need to make sure that folks feel safe, that if they're calling to support someone, they're not gonna be deported or they're not gonna be um, you know, detained if, if the purpose is to help them. So thank you all for bringing this up and, and we'll definitely, at least as an office, I can commit to making sure that there is confidentiality language or pushing to make sure that the the alternative is a real alternative and it's not just um, in, in conjunction with police. Our next speaker is Cynthia Garcia. Cynthia, are you on the line? Cynthia? It doesn't appear that we're getting any audio, Cynthia, so I'm gonna move to the next speaker and maybe we can circle back. Our next speaker is Patricia Paglucia. Patricia, are you on the line? Hello, thank you so much. Um, this is a really exciting conversation and I appreciate D8 hosting and Ed is in the building. I, can, I, I can't see who else is there, but I really appreciate this because it's exciting. Um, that the constituents of all of these fabulous eight districts get to choose where the budget is going. Um, I was born and raised in D4 and I do work in D8. Um, and I just wanna echo and uplift all of the residents with families that live in D8 asking for parks um, that will work for all ages of children so they can have a really fun place to play. And um, I know that Carlos is a strong proponent for um, divesting funds from Phoenix PD. And I think um, when I look at the budget, um, you know, they have like 750 million. And I know on Wednesday, um, city council, um, all but two members approved to give them a further pay raise. I think it would be a brilliant strategy to take some of the money away from Phoenix police and put it into communities. Because um, one thing that I do think is just kind of confusing, you know, the police say like their duty is to protect and serve. And um, I've looked on their website and they say that they um, reduce crime and they can um, prevent crime. But we always call the police after a crime happens. Um, so, you know, they're not even doing what they're intended to do. And I know that city council members um, don't believe that um, the police um, are anti-black and uphold white supremacy, but they definitely do because they're only um, killing black and brown folks, except for, of course, Ryan Whitaker, who I believe was murdered in Sal de Sicio's district by Phoenix police. Um, my point being, um, police by their nature, by um, design and historically, it's a fact that they come from slave patrol. So we need to defund police, take that money and invest it in healthy communities. Please Thank you so your much. Comment. Thank you. Thank you, D8, defund PPD. Uh, let's circle back to Cynthia Garcia and see if Cynthia has audio now. Cynthia, are you on the line? I'm sorry, we aren't hearing you, Cynthia, so we'll move on to Samuel Merton. Samuel, are you on the line? It looks as though Samuel is also not on the line, so our next speaker will be Hava Derby. Hava, are you on the line? I am, thank you so much. Um, I hope you'll circle back to my comrades. There's a couple of people you missed. Um, I wanna to touch on Tanya's call that just broke my heart. 
Um, and seeing as how your uh, recent iteration of a crisis assistant program involves the uh, fire department and we see that fail that they didn't show up to that call. Uh, we also had the fire department recently asking for assistance to deal with the unsheltered in downtown. And if they don't feel safe dealing with the unsheltered, they shouldn't be uh, communing with those citizens. So I'm really hoping we move out of involving any of the fire or to police departments in these calls. I know, Ed, you said that uh, the police wouldn't be involved unless they're necessary. And we know they're not necessary in most of these calls. Most of the calls to 911 are non-violent, non-criminal calls. So, uh, you know, just to talk about cahoots up in Eugene, which no cap is based on, um, you know, of the 150,000 calls they had in one year, I can't remember which year, it was a recent and last few, only 100, around 100 of those calls needed backup from police or fire department. So we can see that it's not necessary to have them involved at all. So I hope that uh, that'll be a consideration that they have no connection to no cap. Um, and also too, this, uh, we know that these programs work best with a budget of 20 million a year. Uh, and this is very easy to do when you look at all of the money that's gonna be saved uh, with, with the police not answering these calls. Um, so I hope those two considerations will be put into this in the next uh, 18 to 24 months as we're developing this connection with no cap. I hope this will be our crisis assistance program in Phoenix. Thank you so much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Hava. I just want to touch on one thing you talked about. Uh, the fire cap program uh, failed to respond to the situation Tanya described. That's because the fire, the existing fire cap program isn't designed to be this program. The existing fire cap program is designed to go alongside fire in response to largely medical and fire events. So if the program, pro program currently today, as it's designed with fire, goes to that and aids the family that has been displaced and needs services and assistance. The, the connection here is that because we have uh, the infrastructure in the fire department with the civilians, and we would expand that greatly, but then they would also be given the charge to respond to the t very type of thing that Tanya uh, described earlier. So I just wanna make it clear, it wasn't that there was a failure to respond by CAP, uh, other than that they, weren't, they aren't called to those type of calls today because they're not equipped to deal with them. This proposal would equip them to deal with precisely what Tanya described. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Kwok. Kelly, are you on the line? Oh. Kelly? Um, hello. Please proceed. I'm here in solidarity. Can you hear me? Yes, Thank please you. proceed. I'm here in solidarity with Black and directly impacted communities. I'm amplifying messages from those communities. Our summers get hotter every year due to climate change, but our city only wants to spend 2.8 million on climate change and heat readiness. Hundreds of people die every year because of the heat, and that number increases every year. The city is condemning people to death by spending money on murderous cops instead of taking that huge amount of money and using it to truly protect us from the summer heat. The plans from your presentation sound inadequate. Carlos represented, represents South Phoenix, an area where black and brown people are ruthlessly displaced and attacked by the police state. South Phoenix is one of the only areas of Phoenix with million dollar blocks. That's where the state makes millions of dollars off of incarcerating black and brown people. We do not want millions of dollars of surplus spending to go towards continuing this inhumanity. Listen to the people for this budget. Yesterday's MOU was already too much. No more money to cops. We have to dramatically invest in true community health and safety. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Reiner. Donna, are you on the line? Of course. Um, I want to say thank you for the meeting. I do currently live in District 4, but I go to a lot of these as the past member, past chair of the City Arts and Culture Commission and the past chair and member of the Friends of Phoenix Public Art. I was thrilled that I didn't have to make an ask this year. So thank you 
for the money, the additional monies that are proposed to give to the Office of Arts and Culture, one for the maintenance of public art, you know, that new park that they're suggesting on Samantha and 55th Avenue should have a piece of public art in it um, at the city's expense. Um, but also because the funding will go to a lot of grants that the office gives to various and sundry um, entities, many of them of which either are in District 8 or serve District 8 residents. So once again, thank you for these uh, proposed additional funds. Our next speaker is Joe Copeland. Joe, are you on the line? Joe? Hey, Manager Zerker and Councilman Garcia and all the staff for hosting this forum. My name is Joel Copeland. I live at 119 South 11th Avenue, which is a half a block south of the Carnegie Library. The Carnegie Library was built in 1908 and is on the Registry of Historic Buildings. It sits on two and a half acres. There's a point of pride in the Capitol Mall plan as it sits midway between the State Capitol Building and the Phoenix City Hall. It is an exceedingly beautiful red brick building built in a post-classic revivalist style. It extends from 10th Avenue to 12th Avenue, from Washington to Jefferson. The Carnegie Foundation's vision was to build buildings as storehouses of knowledge and learning and advancing democracy and fostering creativity. The two and a half acre park and the buildings are owned by the city of Phoenix and leased by the state's legislative council. For what purpose, I'm not sure. The building stands empty, vacant, unused. I and the friends of the Museum of Arizona Arts have toured the interior of the building twice and there is nothing there. There's nothing in there. It's not even used for storage, in direct opposition to the Carnegie Foundation's wishes that it could be used as a fount of knowledge. The Friends of the Museum would like to see this beautiful edifice reopened as the Museum of Arizona Artists under their administration. We are seeking pre-development funding from the surplus to help raise the capital necessary to sustain our development plan, which includes private donations, public grants, admission fees, and other revenue sources. This in keeping with the Capital Mall plan and the Carnegie Foundation, would create an exhibition space for Arizona artists of color, women artists of Arizona, showcasing our indigenous cultures and our Latino community from the South Central. We could build a permanent collection of art saluting our Arizona artists and making a quiet space for intellectual viewing. We would also develop programs for kids at risk and the economically challenged to understand art and to express themselves through art and the creative process. So much could be done and so little is. Help us realize this vision, which we could lift up the entire Central Village community as well as the entire city and state. And thank you for your consideration and generosity in this most worthy project. Our next speaker, I believe Asher Abeg was able to connect. Asher, are you on the line? Yes. Please proceed. Hi, so I really want you guys to build the park on Samantha. Oh, and by the way, I'm six years old. And I think it'll be really fun. And it's really close to my house. And so I really want it to be built. And, and so I'll probably have fun at it. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Tara Loman Rojas. Tara, are you on the line? <clears throat> yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Hi. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is uh, Tara Loman Rojas, and I am here uh, in support of my uh, Black and Brown community members and here to advocate that many be taken from the white supremacist. Um, overly publicly funded organization that does not keep us safe or provide any sort of security for a lot of our community members here. <clears throat> I, uh, I hear people talking about wanting, you, you know, 10 parks and living that have already been prominent community, um, arts funding for uh, programs to expose community members to these things that actually create safety and security for our community um, and we only have so much money and so all the rest, and there's a common theme here people are asking 
need money. Uh, and who has the money? We know who has the money, and that is the white supremacist uh, Phoenix Police Department. So, yeah, I, I just, it's just so simple because after a year of black and uh, directly impacted communities demanding no more money to the violent uh, Phoenix Police Department, the city is going to give millions more in funding to increase the staff and power of the most violent police force in the nation. I'm going to say that again, the, say that again, the most uh, violent police force in the nation. And uh, while we're asking for parks that have been cited here, uh, according to research, to actually create safety for our community. And so our elected officials now will have abandoned us if, if they let this continue. Thank you, I yield my time. And I've checked with our IT staff and that was our last public comment for the hearing. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. For those of you watching, for those of you watching on, on YouTube or other mediums, um, please reach out to our office if you have other comments. Um, remember to use the Fun Phoenix tool um, and check out uh, the rest of the hearings that are happening. The schedule is out on our website, on the city website, and on our social media. Um, and, you know, we got, what, two weeks left of budget season? All right. Two weeks left. Um, thank you all for participating and encourage others to do so. Uh, the park on, on Samantha Way and 55th Avenue takes the prize. You all are doing great work. Um, and for the kids that joined us today, I hope uh, you're learning a lot. And, and thank you for, for joining both the youth one and this one tonight. Thank you. And the hearing's concluded.